tonight and for those of you listening to this very important webinar afterwards. I'd like to uh, also welcome, uh, with a very warm welcome, um, our guests and speakers today, whom I'll introduce shortly. Our webinar today is titled Transforming Pharmacy Practice for Improved Care and Management of Cardiovascular Diseases. The World Health Organization estimates that 17.9 million people die from cardiovascular diseases each year, representing 32% of all global deaths. Pharmacists can play an important role in the prevention, screening, care, and management of cardiovascular diseases. At this digital event, FIP will present a new handbook to support pharmacists and their organizations in providing a range of CVD-related services. In addition, the handbook will be accompanied by the Knowledge and Skills Reference Guide in Cardiovascular Disease, which identifies the knowledge and skills that pharmacists require for the provision of such services, thus offering guidance to pharmacists, academic institutions, and CPD providers. Both publications will be presented today at this event, and they are part of the FIP Practice Transformation Program for Non-Communicable Diseases. Our speakers will explore these in further detail during this webinar. To introduce myself, um, firstly, it's an honour and a privilege to be moderating this event tonight, um, and um, I look forward to it um, very much. My name is Paul Sinclair, and I am the immediate past chair of the Board of Pharmaceutical Practice at FIP, and I'm the president-elect of FIP. I'm a practising community pharmacist from Sydney, Australia, and through various representative roles over the past 20 years, I have been a strong advocate for the delivery of professional services through community pharmacy and for increased participation of pharmacists in disease state management. For this um, event, next uh, slide please. For this event, we are joined by a panel of fabulous speakers and I wanted to sincerely thank each of them for taking the time to prepare their presentations and for making themselves available for this webinar tonight. Firstly, um, Jeremiah Mwangi, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the World Heart Federation in Switzerland. Dr. Pedro Amarilis from the University of the Antioquia in Medellin in Colombia. Dr. Francesca Wirth, Senior Lecturer from the Department of Pharmacy at the University of Malta. Dr. Ines Nunes de Tuna, the FIP Practice Development and Transformation Projects Manager. Dr. Dahlia Bajas, the FIP Lead for Provision and Partnerships and Dr. Genuine Desiree, the FIP YPG Intern and Associate uh, from In Supply Health in Kenya. Welcome to, um, to all of our guests um, tonight. A few announcements um, and some housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and live streamed by YouTube. The recording will be available on our website, events.fip.org. You may ask questions, um, and if you wish to ask questions of the panelists, please use the Q&A box provided. You are welcome to provide feedback to us at FIP at webinars at FIP.org. And if you wish to become a member of uh, FIP, and um, I would certainly encourage you to do so, uh, the benefits of FIP uh, membership include events and webinars, um, as FIP is the global body representing over 4 million pharmacists, pharmaceutical scientists and pharmaceutical educators. If you are a pharmacist, a pharmaceutical scientist or educator, and you would like to become a member, please register for membership on FIP's website at FIP.org. To today's program. Firstly, um, I'll introduce the FIP Practice Transformation Program on Non-Communicable Diseases. Next, uh, Jeremiah Mwangi will present the Interprofessional Collaboration in the prevention and management of cardiovascular diseases in primary health care. Dr. Pedro Amarilis will present the pharmacist's contribution to better cardiovascular disease care, followed by Dr. Francesca Worth, who will address the unmet training needs to advance pharmacy practice in the management of CVDs. Dr. Ines Nunes de Kuna will launch the Cardiovascular Diseases, a handbook for pharmacists, uh, which is the uh, one of the uh, the main purposes of uh, our webinar tonight. And Dr. Balia, Dr. Dalia Bajas and Dr. Genuine Desiree would launch the Knowledge and Skills Reference Guide for Professional Development in Cardiovascular Diseases. 
It's a companion to the FIP Cardiovascular Diseases Handbook for Pharmacists. So a, um, a full agenda um, and some uh, high quality um, presentations will follow. And lastly, um, following these presentations, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists um, and I will also ask them to uh, make some closing remarks. Again, if you have uh, questions that you would like answered um, after the uh, presentations, please put them in the uh, Q&A box. And uh, if you could just identify which presenter you would like to address those questions to. The learning objectives from uh, today's presentations. Uh, there are a number of learning objectives from this webinar. Uh, we're hoping that the attendee will learn the role of pharmacists in prevention, screening, care and management of cardiovascular diseases and their complications, challenges and opportunities for pharmacists in addressing cardiovascular diseases and uh, related services. The knowledge and skills pharmacists need to acquire to support their role in the delivery of cardiovascular disease services. So hopefully all of these um, will be addressed uh, for uh, participants tonight. Um, and uh, uh, we look forward to um, your participation at the Q&A at the end. So to the um, FIP transformation program on NCDs. Um, FIP um, is working in the FIP practice transformation program on non-communicable diseases um, with aims to provide tools and strategic support to FIP member organisations to develop and implement pharmacy services that can have a sustained positive impact in the prevention, screening, management and treatment optimization of NCDs for improved health outcomes and health systems efficiency and sustainability. Next slide, please. While the project will have a particular focus on low and middle income countries, it will encourage implementation by countries of all income levels. Next slide, thank you. The program includes the development of practice support handbooks, knowledge and skill guides, implementation guidelines and support, and training for competence development in each of the five main NCDs areas in the following order. Diabetes, those resources were launched last year. Mental health was launched in July of this year. Chronic respiratory diseases were launched in September. Um, earlier this month, the cancer resources were launched and the cardiovascular disease resources are launched during this event tonight. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see uh, from the slide in front of you um, now, um, the one FIP practice transformation program is in, in, is in alignment with many FIP development goals in particular with advancing integrated services, medicines expertise, and people-centered care. Next slide, please. Today's presentations will focus on FIP practice transformation program on cardiovascular diseases. It's my pleasure now to introduce the first um, of our presenters. Um, and Jeremiah will uh, provide a presentation on the interprofessional collaboration in the prevention and management of cardiovascular diseases in primary health care. Jeremiah has over 15 years experience working in global health policy, advocacy and leadership. In his current role, he leads the policy and advocacy work of the World Heart Federation, working with its members to ensure best practice in cardiovascular disease prevention and management um, is, and is supported by the Global Health Agenda. He has previously served as the Executive Director of REACH, a global health NGO to address rheumatic heart disease, and as the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Alliance of Patients Organisations. Welcome, Jeremiah. The floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. And good morning and good afternoon, everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you for this important event. Um, I'm here on behalf of the World Heart Federation and I'll say a little bit about us and our work. But first, I would really like to congratulate FIP on the launch of these resources for prevention and management of cardiovascular disease um, in primary healthcare. The Federation was proud to be a part of the development of what we hope will be a transformative document 
for pharmacy practice and ultimately for people at risk of and living with cardiovascular disease. And we look forward to continuing our collaboration with FIP and its members towards this goal. In the next few minutes, I hope to set the scene for what um, I hope will be a deeper discussion into how together we can um, work to address and to uh, prevent and manage cardiovascular disease. So first, I'd like to say just a little bit about us and the World Heart Federation. Um, the WHF is an umbrella organization and it represents the global cardiovascular disease community. And our vision is cardiovascular health for all. Our mission has three parts and the first is to connect, to lead and inspire um, by bringing together scientific cardiology societies, heart foundations, health professionals, patients and other organizations with an interest in heart health um, to achieve that goal. The second is to translate science into policy and really to ensure that the very best evidence informs policy making, supports decision makers and leads to strong health systems and good delivery of care. And third is to promote the exchange of information, ideas and practices across borders, um, much like this webinar is, is doing today. Our organisation is made up of um, cardiology societies, heart foundations, patient groups. Some are representing countries and others a particular disease area and they're spread across more than 100 countries around the world. Um, I think like FIP, we're um, in official relations with the World Health Organization and there we advocate at the highest levels to bring cardiovascular disease to the top of the global health agenda. The, I thought um, this slide was nice as it shows a snapshot of some of the issues that WHF has been working on this year. And I thought it was really relevant to our discussion today on interprofessional collaboration because you can see instantly in that um, addressing these, we all have a role. Um, I think all you can probably think about the role of pharmacists or of other health professionals in both on the prevention side and the management side. But I think even though as a global health community, we all have a significant role to play and that it may seem um, fairly obvious, the greatest challenge we face is how we do that in an effective and efficient way that meets the needs of the people and the patients um, that we serve within the boundaries of the health systems we are operating in. And it's that coming together and collaborating um, on these different issues that I think we're still exploring as a global health community how best to do that. Um, and it will look obviously different depending on the context that we are working in. But tools like the, the handbook that's being released today can really serve as a foundation for our efforts. The, I think it goes without saying that the vet, all of the different healthcare um, professions, the healthcare workforce have a critical role in cardiovascular disease. But I think um, it's really important to emphasize how essential the pharmaceutical world, um, workforce is in delivering that goal. And also how ideally positioned um, pharmacy is in terms of strengthening primary healthcare delivery. I think that um, pharmacies are clearly a natural ally in the fight against cardiovascular disease, but there's maybe some value in reiterating why that's um, the case. As you know, CVD claims more lives globally than any other disease, um, but that doesn't need to be so. And we know there are things that we can do to really drastically make an improvement on how things stand today. Prevention, education, and medication management can significantly reduce the burden. And many of the interventions that are necessary um, are simple, they're affordable, um, and they can be delivered in the primary healthcare setting. And so it's, it's, it seems um, fairly clear that perhaps we're not doing as much as we can do in terms of serving people at that primary healthcare level, whether, whether it's for lack of resources or just in terms of the challenge of designing and setting out the health system. But clearly, 
pharmacists can contribute to preventive education, to medication management, and to facilitating things like medication compliance. And just to give an example, for um, up to 80% of secondary events um, in people with known vascular disease can be prevented with treatment with four proven medicines and tobacco cessation. And these are interventions um, that could be undertaken or facilitated at the primary health care level. I think um, what's also clear is that while people need healthcare more than ever, access to healthcare remains inadequate in many settings, and particularly in the area of non-communicable diseases. Um, but we know that healthcare is at its best when it's close to where people live, where they work, um, and where they play. It's also um, a fact we know the highest burden um, from CBD weighs very heavily on low resource settings where access to care is most limited. So we have to do our utmost to think about and be creative and design solutions for getting care to people who need it um, at the local level. And so adapting health systems to improve access to CBD care will be essential in responding to those challenges. We need to move to a more integrated health system and that involves the entire health workforce in providing person-centered CBD care. I wanted to give um, an example of where interprofessional collaboration is so um, clearly uh, a, a, an important solution um, to a challenge that we face. More than half of deaths annually from ischemic heart disease can be attributed to raised blood pressure. And it's one of the most frequent reasons for consultation in primary care. And so to help address the challenge of hypertension, the World Heart Federation produced a roadmap that offers a framework to guide policy and practice in preventing, managing, and controlling hypertension. And the roadmap highlights common barriers to implementing the best practice recommendations, the things that we know that work, and offers some solutions based on how others have overcome the challenges that can be adapted. And you can see that we face many barriers on the demand side, so patients seeking care, the barriers include low access to screening, lack of willingness or motivation, poor um, patient health worker relationship. And on the supply side, so in terms of the health system, we see issues such as low screening rates, poor or misdiagnosis, lack of knowledge of guidelines and drug shortages. And these barriers reflect largely how our health systems are organized, um, the, the, the the discrete nature of the systems and the fact that we often are operating in silos. If we come to the some of the solutions, in one sense you could say the same thing, they're, they're very, in some cases, discrete. Um, but actually we can build capacity at the primary healthcare level and roll out things like opportunistic screening and patient education programs. But the success of these interventions will rely on how well joined up the care is between the different cadre of healthcare professionals. So for example, ensuring that community health workers, cardiologists, nurses, and pharmacists are working together will be the only way to ensure that the medicines are available at the right place and at the right time, that cases are detected, diagnosed, referred, and monitored for the best patient outcomes, and that care is people and patient-centered. I think we can't forget, um, however, that there are many enabling factors that need to be in place for such initiatives to be implemented. For example, I think we're talking um, today in this, this, this program around uh, information and knowledge sharing, best practice sharing, adequate health professional training is critical, critical strong medication delivery systems, providing affordable therapeutics, and adaptation of interventions to local context are all required to fully realize the potential contribution um, that we can make at the primary healthcare level. I wanted to um, share an example where we have been supporting efforts to improve hypertension care um, in Kenya. And we did that through a round table process that fed into the, the development of the new hypertension guidelines and how those guidelines were um, rolled out and disseminated. And just to set somewhat the context a little, the, the treatment, the management of hypertension very much uh, resided at the district level, the tertiary level. It was cardiologist driven and 
one of the challenges that the country is facing is looking at how do we get care to people where they need it? How do we strengthen primary health care? How do we um, strengthen things at the community level? And through the round table, which invited a, a range of stakeholders, four calls to action were agreed. And I think the third on the list spoke strongly to the need to develop new ways of providing services by working with different types of healthcare workers and professionals to deliver that care. But also one of the things that stood out is that we still um, are exploring ways to how to work together and how to collaborate among the different sectors. As part of the drive for universal health coverage um, in Kenya, capacity is being built in the community with healthcare workers and through pharmacies to deliver many of the services uh, that, that were once available at that higher level um, within the health system. And so I think in examples like this, and as we see more of these um, programs developing and a more of a shift to this um, model of delivering care, uh, clearly pharmacists are, are such an important and natural partner um, in that journey. And I think at, at many of our future roundtables and, and at some of the ones that have come before, uh, national pharmacists associations are present, are involved in developing the solutions, um, working through the policy frameworks to, to facilitate that um, collaboration between different healthcare providers. And we hope that in future in all roundtables, there'll be a strong presence from the pharmaceutical, uh, from the pharmacy societies. So if we are to build on initiatives like the roundtables and to tackle cardiovascular disease effectively, we believe we need to invest strongly in the facilitators of collaboration. And I think something that maybe is not always most obvious to, to all of us when we're involved in our day-to-day -day work is just the governance mechanisms that help facilitate dialogue between um, sectors and that allow us to um, explore the best ways and how to develop tools and resources and collaborate and design the health systems um, that we need. And those governance mechanisms also help in terms of policy development and dialogue between stakeholders. On top of that, I think the effective information systems, again, not something that perhaps is um, a priority in our everyday scenarios, but how we can design the health, the information systems that can be delivered, um, that we can deliver care in a patient-centered way. For example, effective protocols for accessing patient records or ensuring them, making sure that we have the registers and the tools that are needed so that care is um, consistent. On top of that, ongoing education, I think that cuts across professions where tools and resources like the handbooks being launched today are developed jointly um, and that can help people support and coordinate um, the work that they're doing. And I think, again, just that, that idea of how we coordinate and work together across different professions, across different cadres, is something that we need to keep investing in and exploring. Collaborating within our communities of professionals, as I'm sure you know, can be challenging, let alone when we collaborate more widely and we try to develop projects um, and to, and to uh, work on shared aims and shared goals. But I think the value makes very much clear for us. And I hope that we can continue these efforts for the benefits of the communities we, we serve. It's very important that we invest in those um, multi-sectoral collaborations that draw on our strengths, draw on our unique expertise and skills. And so I look forward to hearing um, from the rest of the speakers and the panelists today um, about how we can ensure that this work, that the, the handbook and the resources that are being made available can continue to strengthen um, the prevention and management of cardiovascular disease globally. So thank you very much. Jeremiah, thank you so much. Um, and it's um, indeed very pleasing to hear you advocate so strongly and so clearly uh, for the role of pharmacists in the collaborative model of improved care and management of cardiovascular diseases. Um, thank you for that wonderful presentation. If anyone has any questions of Jeremiah, they might just put those uh, to his attention in the uh, Q&A box, please. Uh, we'll move to our second presentation. Um, and our next speaker is Dr. Pedro Amarillis, um, who will talk about the pharmacist's contribution to better cardiovascular disease care. Uh, Pedro heads the research group of the Pharmaceutical Promotion and Prevention at the University 
de um, uh, Antonio Queer uh, in Colombia. Um, he's a uh, heads the Associate Pharmaceutical Care Research Group at the University of Granada in Spain. And his research and um, academic pursuits um, have uh, been focused on pharmaceutical care, clinical pharmacy, and rational drug use. Pedro um, has uh, played the role of tutor to 12 Master of Science and eight PhD uh, students, four in Spain. Um, he is the author and co-author of nearly uh, 180 papers and 30 textbooks and manuals or guides for pharmacists. He is one of the authors um, of our uh, resource today, Cardiovascular Diseases, a Handbook uh, for Pharmacists. Welcome, Pedro, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, good afternoon for pharmacies from, from different countries on the world. Thank you to the FAP, mainly to Ines, to Gonzalo for this opportunity to present you some comments regarding to pharmacies' contribution to better cardiovascular disease care. The main purpose in this 15 minutes is from a pharmacy perspective, present general concepts and key topics related to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and present key topics related to pharmacy role in CV prevention in care of patients with CV risk factors with ACVD, including some features related to professional pharmacy or pharmaceutical service. In a sense, to promote the pharmacy's participation and contribution to achievement of therapeutic objectives and patients with ACVD. Regarding to general concepts and key topics related to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it's important to say that modifiable or controllable risk factors are the main cause of global CVD border. Therefore, they are quite control this clinical global challenge that require a innovative and creative health solution. Uh, the severe risk factor associated to CBD may be metabolic, behavior, or, or environment. And the most important is that these risk factors are the same for the main fine, no communicable disease. So it's important to say that there are three clinical forms of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, which include acute coronary syndrome and chronic coronary syndrome. So cerebrovascular disease, which included ischemic cerebrovascular attack or a stroke and transient ischemic attack. And the third RS is peripheral arterial disease. So it's important to say that atherosclerosis is the pathophysiology process underlying ACVD and Atherosclerotic CV risk as is the probability of presenting an atherosclerotic cardiovascular event within a time period, usually 10 years or lifetime, after occurring for risk factors. Regarding to cardiovascular, cardiovascular pressure types, it's important to say that patients without ACVD are patients in primary prevention or primary prevention. By contrast, patients with ACVD are patients in secondary prevention. This graph shows the relationship between clinical form of ACVD, cardiovascular risk factors, and types of cardiovascular prevention. So patients with coronary heart disease or with cerebrovascular disease or peripheral arterial disease are patients in secondary prevention. In this group of patients, the intervention are focused to prevent the occurrences of the other events reducing prevalence uh, or the death by ACVD. By contrast, patients without ACVD, but, but with major modifiable risk factors, for example, hypertension, dilipidemia, or smoking, are patients in primary prevention. In this group of patients, the intervention are focused to prevent the occurrence of new events or ACVD, reducing incidence, by trying, controlling, or modifying severe risk factors. Finally, patients without ACVD and without uh, major risk factors, but we have some unhealthy behaviors. For, for instance, 
uh, obesity, unhealthy diet plan, uh, physical inactivity, excessive alcohol use, our patients and pri primordial prevention in this group of the persons, the intervention are focused to avoid the development of risk factors in the first place by promoting and adopting a healthy lifestyle through the life. Some comments regarding to pharmacy rolling cardiovascular prevention and care of patients with ACVD. It's important to say that pharmacies can contribute to improve both the process of care and health outcomes. Pharmacies can contribute to reduce the border of CBD and pharmacy can contribute to improve the quality of care of patients with CBD through optimization of pharmacotherapy. Mainly focus to identify and to solve negative outcomes associated with medication and their preventable causes, contributing to effectiveness and safety of the pharmacotherapy. These pharmacy services may be performed on the patient or population level, require the patient and the other healthcare team members' cooperation. So, some comments regarding to professional pharmacy and pharmaceutical services, important to say that pharmaceutical care is the pharmacy's contribution to the care of individuals in order to optimize medicine use and improve health outcomes. Those pharmacies may achieve contribution to healthcare of patients with severe risk factor or with ACVD through professional pharmacy services in the context of pharmaceutical care. Mainly through dispensing, counseling and health education, or through medication review or pharmacotherapy follow-up. So it's important to say that regarding to priorization of professional pharmacy or pharmaceutical service, that ideally in each pharmacy care situation, the patient should receive medication reviewed of pharmacotherapy for love. However, due to complexity in demand time by this professional service, in a practical context, here is a, tar a hard target. So here is need to define both the risk or not achieve the therapeutic goals according to the patient clinical situation and complexity of the therapy regimen and the more suitable professional pharmacy service for reducing the risk in a specific patient. This graph shows the professional pharmacy or pharmaceutical service in patients with severe risk factor or with CBD. Overall, in this group of patients, professional pharmacy service must to contribute to reduce the border of cardiovascular disease by promoting cardiovascular health, avoiding complication, avoiding occurrence of new cause of cardiovascular events, primary prevention, or reoccurrence of cardiovascular events, and the due to cardiovascular disease, secondary prevention. For that, it's important to identification and management of pharmacotherapy risk, identify professional pharmacy service in priorization, priorization that patient needs according to both his, his hair condition and the complexity of the therapy. So dispensing is feeding to patient assess a low risk, I need to ensure the patient receives and know the proper and safe use of medicine. By the other hand, concerning and health education, is feeding to patient assessors a medium risk, aim to promote cardiovascular health, identify, prepare, and motivate change in patients, practicing behaviors, identify and solve their process problems, and improve the monitoring and plan and following of key pharmacology interventions. Finally, medication review or pharmacotherapy follow-up is feeding to patient assessors a high risk, I to identify, prevent, and solve, solve negative outcomes associated with medication. He need to be re realized in a continuous, systematized, documented form, centering to the patient and in collaboration with other health care professional, professionals. The most important is that this pharmacy service may contribute to improve cardiovascular health outcomes in this group of pa the patients. Some comments regarding to intervention and follow-up of patients with cardiovascular risk factor or with cardiovascular disease. This flow chart shows the key steps of this process. The entry is a patient who attending to pharmacy for dispensing. In this patient, it's important to assess the pharmacotherapeutic risk. Patient with high pharmacotherapeutic risk, uh, medication review or pharmacotherapy follow-up is the more suitable services by contrast. Patient without high pharmacotherapeutic risk, the counseling and health education 
could be the more suitable service. In this, it's important to assess the presence of cardiovascular disease. Patients with cardiovascular disease are patients in secondary prevention, are patients with high cardiovascular risk. By contrast, patients without cardiovascular disease are patients in primary prevention. So it's important in, the, in, in all cases to assess the cardiovascular risk. For that, it's important to confirmation of major cardiovascular risk factors and the confirmation of other cardiovascular risk factors. And essentially, it's important to use a tool to assess the cardiovascular risk according to region or country, for example, Framingham, Hertz in the Americas, or SCORE. This tool allows to assess cardiovascular risk as high, medium, or low. In definitely, the most important is that this previous step allows to, to de define the therapeutic objectives in following in concordance with types of prevention, cardiovascular risk assessment, and an integral consideration of major cardiovascular risk. At the end, the most important is that this process contributes to avoid uh, occurrence of new cases of cardiovascular events, primary prevention, or the recurrence of the new events of death due to cardiovascular disease, secondary prevention. Now I go, I like to present some comments regarding to the uh, participation of pharmacy in this group of patients. Excuse me. Uh, it's important in, in this group of patients to assess the patient's pharmacotherapeutic risk. And if it is high, is an indicator that patient needs medication review or pharmacotherapy followed to minimize the risk. The risk. The process needs the pharmacist interviewing the patient, ensuring and assessing viral signs, reviewing clinical records, including drug therapy and laboratory tests, and asking to other healthcare members to solve any question regarding patient health condition or pharmacotherapy. So in this group of patients, it's important to identify and to assess all the major cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, dilipidemia, diabetes, and smoking, and all the risk factors obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and unhealthy diet. It's important to assess and individualize the ACVD risk. Remember that patients with ACVD are patients in secondary prevention, are patients with high CVD risk. Patients without ACVD, primary prevention, but with condition that indicating, indicating high risk for ACVD, for instance, DM, familiar hyper, hypercholesterolemia, chronic kidney disease, and her pylori, are patients with high CV risk. For patients with major CV risk factors, but without ACVD, primary prevention, and without high risk indicators for high cardiovascular disease, you need to assess and to estimate the 10 year risk. A result of assessment of ACVD risk, patient may be categorized as patient in secondary prevention, are patients with high CV risk, Patient in primary prevention with indicators of high CV risk, patient in primary prevention with high CV risk, patient in primary prevention with medium CV risk, or patients in primary, primary prevention with low CV risk. Finally, some comments regarding to intervention in the group of patients. Will this intervention may include assessing BP, TC, BNI, smoking condition, physical activity, and diabetes during, during appointments. Consulting and health education about serious risk factors. In each follow appointment, patient will be provided with verbal and writing consulting regarding CV prevention, identify barriers to advance and solving, and identify and solving and on and and DRP and following every one or three months according to CV risk and pharmacotherapy risk. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present, to present you some comments. Uh, I apologize for my mispronunciation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pedro. That's a, um, a very, very interesting presentation and uh, particularly um, identifying uh, the role of pharmacists, not only just dispensing, but using all their skills as medicine experts um, in the identif identification and risk of uh, pharmacotherapeutic risk. Um, there were some really interesting observations there. Thank you so much.
Uh, we'll now move to uh, our next presentation. And it's a pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Francesca Wirth. Uh, Dr. Wirth is a senior lecturer at the pharmacy uh, department at the University of Malta. Dr. Wirth completed a PhD with a dissertation on the pharmacogenetic implications of clopridogrel therapy, including application of a rapid point of care testing approach. Dr. Wirth is involved in teaching and pharmacy practice research related in teaching, I'm sorry, and pharmacy practice research related to cardiovascular disease therapeutics, and she mentors students undertaking cardiology clinical rotations. Dr. Wirth is a member of the research committee of the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy. Welcome, Francesca. The floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So I will be taking a more um, educational and pharmacy practice based uh, research approach um, in my uh, presentation. So I would like to uh, start off by uh, mentioning that diversity in pharmacy um, education exists and hence there is um, a training gap in terms of patient-centered care sources. And this was identified in um, a paper by Nunes de Cuna et al. in 2016, which compared the undergraduate uh, pharmacy curricula in the United States and the European higher education area. And as we can see uh, in the table, um, the paper reported that institutions in most European countries maintain a greater focus on the basic sciences and a lower load of clinical sciences in the pharmacy curricula compared to the United States, uh, except Malta and, and uh, the Netherlands. Um, and these differences may not be in accordance with international recommendations to educate future pharmacists focused on patient care. So this identifies a training gap and the need for these uh, documents which were developed by FIP. I'd also like to refer to the Nanjing statements on pharmacy and pharmaceutical um, sciences education, which were developed in 2017, and which focus on strategic planning to improve the pharmacy education process. And these statements are now driving pharmacy education to adapt to the, the paradigm of patient-centered practice. And they are uh, helping to support the uh, incorporation of clinical education into pharmacy, uh, into pharmacy curricula. And these statements can easily be applied in the context of cardiovascular diseases that we are talking today. So, for example, within the cluster of statements uh, titled Shared Global Vision, if we look at statement 1.8, for example, it denotes that pharmacists should be champions for good health promotion, for preventive medicine, and for holistic patient management, and must undertake this through an economic, a social, a cultural, and ethical perspective. And the handbook does tackle these, um, this aspect. When we look at the competence, the, the, the professional skills, the competences, the skills and knowledge that pharmacists need to meet the needs um, of the public and to interact with uh, other healthcare professionals, this is also addressed. Also, uh, very, very important, and I'll go into this a bit later as well, uh, experiential educational programs where students are incrementally developing their pharmacy practice skills in a wide variety of um, real life practice uh, care settings. And these are very important to advance practice, even with respect to cardiovascular disease. And I will elaborate um, further. And last but not least, as mentioned in the Nanjing statements, we have continuing professional development. So as pharmacists, we need to build on our previous uh, education uh, as pharmacists. To, be, to help uh, to have um, our graduated professionals prepared for advanced practice roles, including in, um, in cardiovascular diseases. So there are various strategies that can be um, uh, applied to enhance the role of um, pharmacists in the management and care of patients with CVDs. 
and direct patient care experiences, both in community pharmacy and hospital pharmacy, in my opinion, are significant. And they should start at a very early stage, uh, even at undergraduate level, even from the first year um, of the course. But that's what we do here um, in Malta. We start uh, from the first year and we continue to progress then with advanced experiential rotations um, during the Master of Pharmacy or M Farm program. And experiential learning is so important because it uh, fosters development of critical thinking and problem solving related to medicine's use. And during the experientials, the students have the opportunity to apply the clinical knowledge that is taught in the classroom in a practical way with patients and other healthcare professionals. And the, the students are able to reflect on the clinical learning um, experience um, by means of patient case presentations, simulations, discussion of actual patient cases, team-based learning, pharmaceutical care planning. So um, experiential education, which was mentioned, uh, which is a key component of the Nanjing statements, is also very important here and we, where we can use these developed um, documents by um, FIP. Also, uh, apart from experiential um, education, another important supportive strategy is to um, encourage our, our pharmacists to take up postgraduate research, postgraduate education, such as following a PhD program or a level eight uh, doctorate in pharmacy program, which will involve practice based research, which are also very crucial um, to support uh, the advancement of um, pharmacy practice. And in my presentation, I will now be giving some examples of practice research, which was which has been carried out um, here in our department um, in the area of CBD management, which looks at um, optimizing medicines use, monitoring for therapy effectiveness and outcomes, monitoring for side effects which are very important um, to build the, the evidence which is going to advance the, um, the practice. And the first example involved um, developing, uh, implementing, and evaluating a, pharmac a pharmacist-led medication use review service in a community pharmacy setting for patients on high-risk drugs. In this case, uh, it was warfarin, which contributes to improving therapy management. And medication review by the pharmacist involved medication reconciliation to detect drug-related problems, developing an individualized care plan for the patient, carrying out point of care um, INR monitoring, and recommending actions for the identified problems which should be referred either to the physician, can be tackled by the pharmacists themselves, and also um, involving the patient as well. So, for example, with uh, how to improve uh, medication adherence. And what I want to stress here is that's not just medication review once, okay? The importance of patient follow-up in, in, car in cardiovascular diseases. We should follow up our patients in the community, uh, either by also by telephone follow-up. So the importance of uh, patient follow-up is very important. Another example of a practice research which we looked at with regards to optimizing medicines use is the evaluation of drug therapy appropriateness and clinical pharmacist intervention documentation using, for example, medication assessment tools. We did this for the long-term management of atrial fibrillation and stroke in a rehabilitation hospital. However, these medication assessment tools are available for different disease states and can be applied in different settings, such as for the management of hypertension, for the management of heart failure, ischemic heart disease. So these can be used um, as tools by pharmacists to uh, optimize the appropriateness of drug therapy. Apart from optimizing medicines use, it's important for us pharmacists to monitor the effectiveness of therapy. And here I just have an example of um, the monitoring of LDLC levels at different time points in patients with ischemic heart disease and are on statin therapy. And this, this type of monitoring can be performed in community, it can be formed in the hospital, performed in the hospital to check 
that the, the drugs we are giving our patients are effective, they are reaching the targets in evidence-based guidelines. And then the pharmacist, together with the team, can uh, recommend either a change in dose or uh, a change in statin, okay, to make sure that the patients are um, basically having the, the uh, optimal use of their medication. There are other examples, but apart from therapy effectiveness, very important, we have uh, as pharmacists an important role in monitoring the safety of therapy. And here I have just uh, three examples of practice research which we carried out, um, starting with digoxin. As we know, digoxin is limited by its narrow therapeutic index. And in this practice research, we analyzed serum drug uh, concentrations to see the compliance to the target range which is recommended in the guidelines. We also looked at serum potassium levels, we also looked at the renal function, and we found uh, patient, uh, many patients who were below and above the target range. And this shows us that healthcare professionals, including pharmacists, should be proactive in digoxin use monitoring and they need to be aware of the symptoms of chronic digoxin um, toxicity, irrespective of the SDC. Um, so such research shows us the importance of uh, personalization of digoxin dosing by pharmacists in accordance with various patient-specific characteristics. So we need to look at age, we need to look at renal function, we need to look at frailty, electrolyte levels, comorbidities, concomitant medications, and these are all addressed in the documents um, which, are, which were developed um, by um, FIP. Another example um, of another drug, um, which is um, Entresto, Sacubotril Valsartan, which is indicated in uh, chronic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, a drug which has shown to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and also hospitalization in these patients. However, this drug also has safety concerns. So as pharmacists, we need to be aware and we need to monitor our patients. We need to monitor for hypotension. We need to monitor for hyperkalemia, renal impairment, angioedema, okay? And in fact, we carried out this medication use evaluation to investigate how tolerable this drug um, is and it, uh, it, it transpired the need for um, regular monitoring focusing on blood pressure measurement renal function um, and potassium as an important role um, for pharmacists statins as well uh, quite a very commonly used drugs but can be problematic as well so pharmacists here have an important role with respect to monitoring for side effects identifying any muscle side effects, um, any myalgia, any myopathy, and also to monitor the liver function to uh, identify any deranged um, liver function tests. And together with efficacy and safety, something which is not so easy to do, um, but something which is very important and is also tackled in the handbook, is the importance of monitoring for adverse cardiac outcomes. So for example, we can use pharmacogenetics um, to monitor the uh, cardiac outcomes uh, in patients who, um, who un underwent uh, per percutaneous coronary intervention and um, are taking dual antiplatelet therapy with aspirin and clopidogrel. So the practice research we carried out showed that patients who have the loss of function um, CYP to C19 star to allele are at an increase, a significantly increased risk of adverse cardiac outcomes, specifically instant restenosis within one year after the procedure. And this shows us that the role of the pharmacist in preemptive pharmacogenetic testing within the multidisciplinary team, which can be applied to patients to individualize antiplatelet therapy and decrease these adverse cardiac outcomes, obviously also taking into consideration non-genetic factors um, as well. 
Another drug which we should evaluate outcomes uh, is pyrofiban, pyrofiban, which is used in high risk um, PCI patients, so high primary uh, PCI patients who had um, a STEMI. And uh, we carried out, in fact, this pyrofiban use evaluation study to determine whether uh, it's the contemporary use of thyrofiban, in fact, is associated with clinical benefits in the framework of short and long term outcomes. And we evaluated cardiac death, recurrent MI, uh, we looked at acute stent thrombosis, stroke, heart failure, bleeding, thrombocytopenia, uh, the impact on kidney function, etc. And we looked at the, this at different time points post. Uh, tyrofibon, tyrofibon dosing, especially during the procedure and 24 hours after as well. And we found that uh, overall the benefit risk ratio um, was good with a relatively low risk of bleeding uh, complications. So the usefulness of tyrofibon in saving patients in life threatening situations was, um, was seen. And this is an important role for um, for us pharmacists. So these are just some examples of practice-based research, but I want to, to stress okay, the importance of practice-based research, research to strengthen these pharmacist-led services. The pharmacy, um, the practice-based research is going to build the evidence base to develop uh, the service, to commission new services as well, to improve patient care and also to contribute to health service knowledge as well in the context of the prevention, care, um, and management of cardiovascular diseases. And to, to conclude, um, it has been indeed, it has indeed been a, an honor to have collaborated with FIP in the development of the handbook and the knowledge and skills um, companion guide, which aim to be a valuable resource not only to support pharmacists in implementing evidence-based interventions but also to support educators educators who are responsible for creating the context that will allow these evidence-based recommendations to be effectively um, implemented so i i commend fip on this um, initiative um, and I shall now pass on the floor to my colleagues Ines and Dalia, who will speak to us more about these, um, these two um, very um, useful uh, and valuable documents. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesca. Um, a great presentation um, and certainly highlighting the importance of uh, practice-based research, uh, which would then um, uh, inform um, education for pharmacists to improve uh, their role um, in contributing to cardiovascular disease care. Thank you so much. Um, as uh, Francesca um, uh, suggested, we're now going to launch uh, the resources, um, the Cardiovascular Diseases a Handbook for Pharmacists, um, firstly, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ines Nunes uh, Dukuna, um, who is the FIP Practice Development and Transformation Projects Manager. Um, Innes has worked as a community pharmacist for more than 14 years and taught for six years at the university, at the university as a professor in the integrated Masters in Pharmaceutical Sciences course in Portugal. She received a Masters in Pharmaceutical Care um, and a PhD in Pharmacy in the area of Social Pharmacy from the University of Granada in Spain. She's the author of several publications focusing on the area of pharmacy practice Especially, patient, especially related to patient-centered care. She's the lead and one of the authors of the Cardiovascular Diseases, a Handbook for Pharmacists. Um, and it's uh, my pleasure to hand over to you now, Ines, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paul. And thank you very much to our first three panelists for their amazing presentations and for their contribution as an authors and the reviewers of the CVD Handbook. I start to say that it is a huge pleasure to be here presenting this important publication that you can find in the link that you can see on the next slide. Yes, here. Um, and also you can um, find this publication uh, at the FIP microsite on NCDs. 
The publication I'm presenting today was a joint effort involving several authors and reviewed by a group of experts in the field of cardiovascular diseases from around the world. As Paul said before, this is the last of five sets of publications to support the role of pharmacists in NCDs prevention and management. On the next slide, the CVDN book aims to identify and describe the key evidence-based interventions by pharmacists in this area with the dual aim of supporting their implementation in pharmacy practice and of supporting advocacy efforts by FIP member organizations towards the optimization and expansion of pharmacists' scope of practice in CVDs and NCDs in general. Cardiovascular diseases impose significant health and economic burdens on individuals, healthcare system, systems, and society overall. On the next slide, you can see that CVDs include a range of conditions. Together, CVDs are the primary cause of death worldwide. And as Paul said at the beginning, beginning of this event, the World Health Organization estimates that 17.9 uh, million people die from CVDs each year, representing 32% of all global deaths. Uh, on the next slide, you also can, can see that evidence also suggests that the number of people worldwide suffering from CVDs almost doubled from 271 million in 1990 to 523 million in 2019. Out of the 17 million premature deaths in people under 70 years of age due to NCDs in 2019, um, uh, approximately 6.4 million were caused by CVDs, with over 75 of deaths occurring in low and middle income countries, where the population has less access to primary healthcare service for prevention, early detection, management, and treatment treatment of people with cardiovascular risk factors. Like, said, uh, like Pedro said before, CVDs develop progressively, progressively over time, mainly resulting from an interaction, interaction a multiplica multiplication of uh, risk factors, as you can see on the next slide. These risk factors are considered modifiable because intervention in lifestyle make it possible to obtain gains in health and quality of life for patients suffering from CVDs by reducing morbidity and mortality and reducing individual social and economic costs arising from the treatment of this disease. Next slide, please, Ruben. So pharmacy-based people-centered care goes well behind medicines use and optimizing effectiveness and safety. Given the prevalence and the health economic burden that CVDs can put on patients and health systems, actions are needed to prevent this disease from developing. Interventions preventing risk factors and better disease management, especially improving access to healthcare and improving adherence to evidence-based therapy, therapies, will consistently give better health, well-being, and the economic outcomes. So it is important that pharmacists are able to provide for needs in this area and that their services and roles are leveraged, expanded, and consolidated. In addition, it is essential that pharmacy professional organizations at global, regional, and national levels support practitioners in implementing and providing services in this area. On the next slide, you can see opportunities for pharmacies to engage in CVD man management. They are many and ranging uh, from medication management to collaborative care in enhancing overall health. Pharmacies can play a key role in screening, prevention, and modification of risk factors, providing useful advice on how to keep or achieve a healthier lifestyle and reduce the impact of risk factors, for example, through smoking gum cessation and weight management services. They also provide excellent medication management for patients on long-term treatments. This can include specific activities such as patient education and counseling, medication review, 
or the identification of risk factors through, for example, the measurement, measurement of blood pressure or um, glycemia. As experts in medicines, pharmacists are uniquely positioned to provide evidence-based ph pharmacotherapeutic recommendations, identify and resolve medicines-related problems, support primary care providers with the development of treatment and monitoring plans, provide comprehensive education to patients and promote adherence to their prescribed treatments. When developing treatment and monitoring plans, pharmacies are encouraged to work collaboratively with other healthcare professionals to ensure optimal outcomes for their patients. Pharmacists can also recommend non-pharmacological -pharmac measure, measures that patients may follow in addition to their prescribed medicines to improve their blood pressure, lipid profile, uh, glycemic control, weight and health outcomes. Since, pharmacy, since pharmacies are easily accessible and uh, widely distributed in the community, a maximal benefit could be expected from interventions provided, provided in this content. On the next slide, uh, you can see an overview of the handbook. This handbook has outlined the many ways in, it, in which pharmacists can contribute to improving cardiovascular health among their patients, including by acting as, a, as agents for health behavior change and other preventive services, screening for CVDs, referring patients to additional care, working as part of interprofessional teams, optimizing the use of medicines and improving treatment adherence. So the handbook is organized by um, chapters and we start the handbook with the definition and characteristics of uh, CVDs and with the burden, burden of CVDs and their risk factors. The second, uh, the second chapter talks about the pharmacist integration in CVD care. We um, dedicate an important chapter to the prevention and control of CVDs, where we talk about the pharmacist's role in promoting cardiovascular well-being and he uh, healthy lifestyles, identifying and preventing modifiable CVD risk factors, and what is the role of vaccination in the prevention and man management of CVDs. In chapter four, we present tools and point of care tests to support pharmacists role in screening and identification of clinical manifest manifestations of CVD. Chapter five is about referral and interprofessional collaboration to support people living with CVDs. In chapter six, we present the main therapeutic categories to use, uh, use to manage and treat CVDs. We have devoted uh, an important chapter to optimizing the use of medicines where we address issues such as medication review, improving medication acceptance and endurance, evaluating and resolving medicines related problems and developing treatment and monitoring plans. In chapter eight, we talk about the clinical and economic outcomes metrics for CVD services. Uh, chapter nine gives a guidance for practice-based re research on pharmacists' roles in CVDs. Chapter 10 talks about important ethical considerations when caring for people living with CVDs. And we finalize the handbook with a, a chapter about the barriers to improving CVD services and facilitators to help overcome that, uh, overcome them, them, them. So, in conclusion, uh, pharmacists should co consider how to integrate CVD services into their daily practice and how these services may benefit their patients, community, and the health system as a whole. Despite the barriers that exist to implementing some of these services, there are many opportunities for pharmacists to increase their role as public health professionals and primary healthcare providers by taking steps through, through preventing, identifying, and managing the treatment of people living with CVDs. Both pharmacists and pharmacists are well positioned to develop and implement structure and evidence-based CVD prevention strategy, strategies and patient-centered services 
that improve patients' health outcomes in CVDs. The same book compiles several examples of evidence-based interventions by pharmacists around the world that have led to positive health and economic outcomes for patients living with CVD. We are sure we will find them valuable and inspirational. Before ending my presentation, I want to express my sincere gratitude to all the authors who collaborate in the dra drafting process of this handbook, whose names are listed on the slide. Thank you very much for your expertise and collaboration. I also want to acknowledge to all the members of the advisory group whose, name has, uh, whose names are listed in this slide for their precious co uh, comments and su suggestions in revising this handbook. Finally, FIP also thanks the World uh, Heart Federation and the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy for their expert contributions to this publication. FIP trusts that this resource will contribute towards advancing the role of pharmacies in the prevention and man management of CVDs around the world. I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. Ines, thank you so much. Um, and congratulations to everyone involved. Um, it's a magnificent resource um, and one that should be utilised by every pharmacist. Um, the second uh, resource that has been launched um, today um, is a knowledge and skills reference guide for professional development in cardiovascular disease, a companion to uh, the FIP Cardi Cardiovascular Disease Handbook for Pharmacists. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Dalia Bajis, who is the lead um, at FIP for provision and partnerships. Dahlia comes from a background in pharmacy practice and academia. She is a registered pharmacist in Australia and has a PhD in pharmacy education and training from the University of Sydney. Dahlia will be joined by Genuine Desiree, who is a uh, pharmacist who currently lives and works in Kenya. He has a keen interest in global health, policy making, and pharmaceutical supply chain management. He currently serves um, as an FIP at FIP as a YPG intern and works as an associate um, at In Supply Health in Kenya. Firstly, welcome, Dahlia. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. Really appreciate the kind introduction. I will hand over actually to my colleague, Genuine, who will run through the first lot of slides, and then I will take over from, from him. We were doing a bit of a double act. Thanks, Genuine. I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Dahlia, and thank you, Paul. Um, greetings, colleagues, and thank you so much for joining and sticking with us to this point of the webinar. Um, we are truly honored and excited to launch and share with you the FIP Knowledge and Skills Reference Guide for Professional Development in Cardiovascular Diseases. As Dahlia has mentioned, I will start us off and she will crown it all. I'll begin with a little background. Um, this publication is built on the FIP Cardiovascular Diseases, a handbook for pharmacists that is being launched uh, concomitantly. And it was developed to support pharmacists in the professional development, in their professional development in the area of cardiovascular diseases. It is intended to serve as a guide for continuing professional development providers in the area of CVD. And it also serves to expand the full potential of pharmacists in the delivery of services and responding to the needs of people living with cardiovascular diseases. Um, so how did we develop this guide? We first took a look back at existing publications and we, we started with the Beating Uncommunicable Diseases in the Community publication that was launched by FIP in 2019. We also borrowed a lot from the FIP Cardiovascular Handbook, and we were able to map out the pharmacist roles, interventions, and services that, that can be found in these publications. We then went further to augment these initial findings with up-to-date and peer-reviewed literature 
on pharmacist roles in managing cardiovascular diseases. Finally, we shared our drafts with an advisory group for review, fact checking and feedback. And this is the recipe that gave us the knowledge and reference guide that we are launching today. So how are the, how are the statements um, categorized in this knowledge and reference guide? Uh, the statements are categorized by topic and are linked to the four competency clusters of the FIP Global Competency Framework version two of 2020. Um, the, the competency clusters are listed to the right, the right of the slide. So we, we started with a sort of a wide scope and then we, we narrowed it down. So we, we organized the statements to re first reflect broad topic areas that are cross-linked with uh, our competency clusters. And then we, we narrowed it down to core topics that are related to the pharmacist roles that we identified and finally, we, we focused on specific knowledge areas, as you will see in the next slide. This gave us the structure, flow, and coherence that you will see in the, in the guide. So the guide is organized into two parts. The first is the knowledge guide, which describes the key knowledge areas that are required by pharmacists in the care and management of people with cardiovascular diseases. And the second is the associated skills guide, which summarizes um, the associated skills pharmacists ought to acquire and apply to support pe people living with um, cardiovascular diseases. Um, these associated skills are connected to the preceding key topics covered in the knowledge guide. And so they're, they're not separate, they're interconnected. The knowledge and reference guide um, can be used as a self-learning tool for professional development and also as a supportive tool in the development of training courses in cardiovascular diseases for pharmacists. So here, here's an example of um, one of the knowledge statements. As you can see, we started with a, a broad topic area, which is therapeutics, and then we narrowed it down to, to core topics and then to a specific topic, which is anatomy and physiology. And then we have our corresponding knowledge, knowledge statements. So to, to see this and more, you can scan the, the QR code that is displayed um, to uh, download the publication. Additionally, a, a link to the publication will be shared in the chat. Um, now, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the input of and extend our sincerest and utmost gratitude to our reviewers, Dr. Francesca from Malta, Benigna Villasuso from Spain, Oscar Penin from Spain, and Professor Stefan from Belgium. And on behalf of the Federation, I'd also like to extend our gratitude to the European Society of Clinical Pharmacy for its expert contributions to this publication. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Bajis to crown it all. Over to you, Doc. Thank you so much, Genuine. And um, thank you so much for our previous speakers who have really provided a great background, but also a, a, a great segue into uh, the importance of having such publications produced by our Global Federation, FIP, to support in the care and management of uh, patients, individuals living with cardiovascular disease. Um, I'd like to also echo Genuine's final words to acknowledge the participants, our um, experts who supported the production of not just the handbook, but also specifically the knowledge and skills reference guide that you can now acquire via the URL in the chat box or previously through the QR code. Thanks, Genuine. I'd like to move us on to the next um, topic that I want to touch on, but I also would like to reflect on some of the um, some of the thoughts and uh, important pieces of information that have already been shared by the previous speakers. And I think an, an echoing um, thread amongst them all was the importance of working together. And I quote um, Jeremiah's uh, final uh, statement or in the middle of his 
presentation when he said that together we can work to manage CBDs. And this is exactly why we're all here today, to really shed a light on a disease area of non-communicable diseases that requires the interprofessional collaborative approach to address our patients' needs, right from prevention, screening, to management, to treatment, and monitoring and follow-up. And pharmacists sit at the heart of all of this, um, as our previous speakers have indicated, but also as research has supported us with, as um, Francesca's um, presentation showed us. Pharmacists sit at the heart of this because they have a role to play across the spectrum, right from prevention all the way to follow-up and monitoring. And FIP, whilst it provides us all with um, resources in this area and also other areas um, in non-communicable diseases, FIP also positions itself within a strategic plan and a vision to advance pharmacy worldwide to be a global platform for provision, being continuing professional development courses and programs through partnerships, through working together, this common thread that has already been uh, mentioned several times in, in this presentation, that together we could advance pharmacy, together we can address pa our patients' needs, together we can address our population's health requirements. So through the provision and partnerships program that I have the honour and privilege of leading at FIP, FIP represents um, a global platform that everybody can benefit from, and that is through providing quality, um, continuing professional development educational programs and um, training programs that could acquire the FIP seal in recognition of its quality, but also in recognition of its alignment to the FIP vision and mission and the FIP development goals. And I would like to invite you, if you could just click on the next slide, please, for me, Genuine, I'd like to invite you to consider um, finding out more about the provision through partnerships program from our website, or you can, you're more than welcome to email me directly if you um, happen to be a CPD provider and educationalist um, in the area of cardiovascular disease and, and interested to know more about the FIP seal for a program that is of quality and also of alignment with our DGs. Um, if it's in the area of CVD or other areas um, in uncommunicable diseases, you're more than welcome to scan the QR code appearing on the screen or emailing me directly at dahlia at fip.org. Through this program, we provide our members and also the wider profession around the globe of uh, assurances that these particular programs are in alignment and they are together with us on our journey to progress the global vision to advance pharmacy worldwide so that we can together um, work on in, in, in this mission to achieve it. With this, I'd like to just sincerely thank the entire crew behind the scenes um, in, the, um, in the practice trans transformation and development team um, for all the support and all the hard work. Um, it has been a, a successful year producing five lots of um, resources for you all. Uh, as Paul already mentioned earlier in his presentation, please do visit our website to find out more about these resources that you could use in your own context and in your own local environments. Hope you find them all supportive. Thank you so much. And handing back to our moderator, Mr. Paul Sinclair. Uh, thank you, Dahlia, and thank you, Genuine. Um, uh, that's a tremendous um, outcome to have uh, both those resources launched today. Um, and uh, congratulations um, has been said a couple of times, but congratulations to everyone involved. Um, an outstanding um, uh, outcome for uh, for pharmacists. Okay, we'll now move to, if there are any questions, could you please put them in the Q&A box? Um, and I've got a couple of uh, questions I would just like to uh, deliver to the, um, the panellists before we have some closing uh, statements. I just invite all the panellists to turn their their uh, cameras and, and microphones on, please. So in the first instance, and I'm very conscious of time, um, to Francesca, to Jeremiah and Pedro, uh, just in a very brief, succinct response, could I ask you two questions? Firstly, FIP is working on a practice transformation program aiming at achieving sustainable impact 
at a local level in terms of cardiovascular disease through pharmacists. This will involve the training of the pharmacy workforce, the delivery of CBD interventions, and the monitoring of impact. What would be your number one recommendation for the success of a program like this? And secondly, in your view, what is the most simple cost-effective intervention a pharmacist can provide in all regions as part of the practice transformation program on cardiovascular disease? Francesca, there's a lot in a lot of words in those questions, but the two key takeouts, number one recommendation for the success of the CBD program and the most simple cost-effective intervention a pharmacist can deliver in any setting. So uh, in my opinion, the, uh, the number one recommendation for success is training, hands-on training, practical training um, in community, in, uh, in hospital with experiential um, rotations, uh, team-based learning, case-based learning, actual patient cases. I think that is the way that we can really focus on not just learning which drugs that I know are should be prescribed, but also the monitoring in terms of effectiveness, in terms of, in terms of side effects, in terms of interactions, looking at patients at a whole, uh, as a whole with the different comorbidities um, together, not just cardiovascular disease on its own. So I think um, I would go for experiential um, learning as the number one recommendation. Um, with regards to cost-effective intervention, I think patient education and counselling is the easiest on risk factors. Um, smoking, blood pressure control, diet and physical activity, I think that is the most uh, practical and cost-effective and we need to start you know, from, from the core before it gets into um, a bigger problem. And I think medication use review is something that us pharmacists can can easily do and can pick up quite a lot of problems from, uh, from, from a medication review. Thank you very much. Jeremiah, um, very quickly, Thanks. your two, uh, <laughs> your two responses. Yes, for the first one on sustainability, I would say engagement of the, um, say I'd say cardiology community, cardiology societies. I think we've seen a lot of um, programs where different guidelines are being used in a the country, there's uh, different ways of working. And so more harmonization, I think is, is critical, um, particularly um, using the same simple treatment protocols and things like that, so that the right medicines are available in the right place. And the intervention, in a way, um, I was thinking blood pressure monitoring, um, just as, the, there are so many undetected cases and in the case of cardiovascular disease, I think going some way to um, identifying at-risk people sooner um, and supporting them either through interventions or medication is, is going to be critical if we're going to have a very big transformative effect. Thank you very much, Jeremiah and Pedro. Thank you. Re regarding to the recommendation, I, I agree with uh, Francesca, maybe be because I have Professor, too. I believe that the education and training of the pharmacy workforce is the key. I, I believe that the two, the two tools that FIP published today are important in, in this way. Regarding to the most simple uh, intervention, I, I believe that counseling and health education focus to adopt five metrics of faster BAWET for cardiovascular health. Which is the tiling hub in the hub boot is an important uh, intervention. It can be implemented use easy in the context of pharmacy practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you um, to all our panelists. That's been a, uh, a most enlightening um, presentation tonight. Um, it's a great achievement uh, for those involved with the production of these two uh, very uh, very fine resources. Um, it's the fifth instalment, as has been mentioned um, in the um, NCD uh, story with uh, FIP. Um, and I would just uh, say to everyone who's been involved, thank you very much. The, um, the outputs have been um, of a, an extremely high quality. Um, and most importantly, they will assist pharmacists in their everyday practice. Um, I would uh, suggest the main message from tonight has been collaboration. Uh, and uh, through collaboration, pharmacists um, will be able to influence 
uh, better health outcomes and better health, better management of um, NCDs and in particular cardiovascular disease. So it's um, it really is a case of um, through collaboration, we will um, utilize our full set of um, skills as medicine experts um, and deliver much stronger health outcomes to our patients. Thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight, uh, wherever you have come from. Thank you to the FIP staff for supporting the presentation of uh, tonight's webinar. Um, and thank you um, uh, principally uh, to each of our presenters uh, for a wonderful job. Um, and uh, I would remind everyone that um, a recording of this webinar will be uh, available on the uh, FIP website. Uh, and we look forward to you joining future uh, FIP webinars um, as they become available. Thank you all and farewell to all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.